Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar, Wildlife and Watercolor. With us today is Miss Lonnie, our Humane Ed Coordinator. Hey Lonnie. Hey everyone. And, hi. And our Wildlife Manager, Lauren Hamlet. Hi Lauren. Hi. So in true wildlife spirit, uh, Lauren is going to be doing this webinar from her backyard, just in case she spots a critter or a bird or something like that. Um, and so <laughs> before we get started, I just wanted to share with you a couple of webinar reminders. All right, so here are the supplies you'll need. We hope that you got this information in a couple of your uh, confirmation emails. Um, you'll need your watercolor paints and some water. Um, some various size paint brushes or a watercolor pen. It can be any paintbrush that you're comfortable using. Um, either watercolor, cardstock, or mixed media paper. Um, but whatever you can grab today is fine. And also a pencil. Um, we hope that you were able to print out the coyote and turtle templates. Um, if not, if you have it printed out, you can cut along with Miss Lonnie. Um, otherwise, don't worry, you can just watch the webinar for today and then tomorrow you can do this on your own. So you're just gonna follow Miss Lonnie along as she watercolors. The other thing we wanna remind you is that you can hear us, but we can't hear you and that's because you're automatically muted by GoToWebinar. And you should be able to see our screen and see Miss Lonnie and Lauren, but we won't be able to see you. If you need to ask a question during this webinar, you can do so using the question drop down menu, and you can just type your question in, into the box. I will be the only person who sees your question, so don't worry um, about what type of question you need to ask. If you need technical help, you can also do that. We also wanna remind you about some other uh, upcoming kids webinars we have. So in June, we have our cat treat cooking show on June 16th from 12 to 12.30. And then we have our taking care of kittens webinar all about how to, how to take care of kittens and what to do if you find them. And that's on June 30th from 12 to 12.30. Um, you or a parent can register at pasadenahumane.org slash kids at home. All right, and with that being said, I'm gonna have Miss Lonnie and Lauren take it away. Hey guys, I'm really excited that you guys are here and I'm hanging out with the awesome Miss Lauren. Um, really quickly before we start, um, Miss Sarah did go over brushes with you guys. So if you guys have various size brushes, it's really important that you utilize these um, depending on how big or small you want some of your brush strokes to look like. So I'm going to be using a slightly larger brush. So this is sort of what we're going to, uh, what my goal is today is sort of the background to look like something really abstract for both pieces. So that's for the turtle piece. And then we're going to work on a coyote sunset. And those are the first parts of our step-by-step -step process. So before we start, I'm actually going to introduce to you these cool little nifty watercolor pens. These are actually what I use. Um, usually when you're a kid, you get these in your packs and your sets. But I really, really dig these um, because you can put water in them already, so they're ready to go. Um, and then one thing I didn't add to there is you is having a napkin. A napkin is really important because you can like dry, dry off your brushes that way. So that'll be something I kind of have in the background. So if you see me wiping it off, it's to clean off the color from the watercolors that I'm using. So I have two various watercolor pens I'm working on. I'm going to use the bigger one with the bigger brush the flat brush, the flat brush, if you can't tell. Um, so before we start doing that, we're gonna select our colors. So I really love this one. You can see it because it has a whole rainbow of different colors that we can use. And so I'm opting to use these really cool greens uh, for the background. And I wanna do a light color background because I want my turtles to pop out and they will pop out if I use a lighter color in the back. So that's really important to kind of say in advance. And I'm probably gonna say it twice to you guys because kids really need to know that once you start with light, you always start with light. You don't go dark to light, you go light to dark because with dark, you can't go back and undo anything. So we're gonna get started. And I'm gonna talk to Lauren in a minute about our awesome environment that our turtles sort of live in. 
Um, but I'm gonna pick this color, this color green here, the lightest color. And I'm just gonna do some really light abstract colors that just kind of go throughout the whole page. So I'm gonna get started. You guys can kind of see, my friends can follow along, but keep in mind that this is a recorded video. So you can always go back and practice a few times. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do sort of these brush, brush strokes that are really sort of organic and just sort of feel very light and easy, just like that. And so I wanted to do kind of a green background. Um, and I don't know, Lauren, like do turtles, what kind of water do, you, to, do these kind of turtles live in with this kind of background usually? This scheme. Uh, great color. question. Yeah, so there's a couple different kinds of turtles that you might find in, in Southern California in our area. Um, if you're close to the beach, the most uh, common sea turtle is going to be the green sea turtle. Very creative name there. Um, and and there's some other there's some other water or uh, saltwater ocean turtles too, like the giant leatherback turtle. Um, mm. But those are pretty rare. The green sea turtle is definitely the most common. Um, and the ones you might see inland more sort of in freshwater areas and what you might actually see at the shelter if, if um, you've ever been to the shelter and seen some turtles are red-eared sliders. Um, they're actually not native to Southern California. Um, they mm. are native to New Mexico, uh, Indiana, West Virginia, throughout Kentucky and Tennessee and Georgia and into North Mexico. Um, but they've really come to uh, thrive here in Southern California. So if you ever go to the park or the Arboretum um, and you see turtles in the ponds, they're usually the red-eared sliders. And those are the ones with the red stripes on the side of their faces. They're not actually their ears. Oh, that's so interesting. Do we have a lot of those currently at the shelter? I believe right now there's only one big one. Um, and and she is taking up the pond. She has it all to herself right now, luckily. Um, how big do they usually get, Lauren? Uh, they tend to get about the size of a dinner plate. Um, people... People usually like to adopt them when they're nice and small because they're so cute. But um, but eventually they will get to be big and, and will need a pond. So if you are considering adopting a, a turtle that's smaller, just uh, know that it's, it's a bigger commitment than just having a tank inside. You can do that while they're small for sure, um, but it's really important that the water stays warm. Um, like I said before, they come from really warm areas where the water is really nice and warm. Um, so that's going to be the most beneficial thing for them when you're um, setting up their habitat. Got it. And so our sea turtles, can you tell us a little bit more about our sea turtles? Sure, yeah. So they're out, out, you know, off the coast, all down the Southern California coast. Um, they, they're omnivores. Um, so in their environment, they're going to find, they're going to be going towards places that have a wide variety of animal life um, that they can munch on, uh, including insects, crustaceans, uh, they even like those sea grasses, like seaweeds and things like that. Um, and worms. They, of course, like worms. But the funny thing is they don't have any teeth. And neither <laughs> do the they neither do the red-eared sliders. Uh, they have what's called a beak, just like a bird. Um, but, but it'll still hurt if they bite you, believe me. Um, and, and so they, they use their, their beak to sort of tear that stuff apart, um, and, and get their nutrients from the, from the ocean. Um, they usually are seen closer to shore in late summer, or late spring and early summer when it's breeding season. Uh, the males will arrive in the offshore waters first, and the females then will come to the beaches and lay their eggs. Um, and and the the lay their eggs and they'll just say goodbye and then it's up to the babies to hatch and crawl out of the sand and get all the way to the ocean wow that's that sounds like quite a challenge for the little babies to do it, it is there do are you, places that people yeah, have said, sorry yeah i was gonna ask you that you read my mind so where where are they where can you see them or? Uh, 
Well, um, I'm not sure exactly where the places are in Southern California. I think that'd be a good research topic if you guys wanted to look that up later after the um, after the uh, watercoloring um, and you want to do some further research, find out where near you is um, is doing some sea turtle conservation. Um, and usually, I mean, with the pandemic, it makes it a little bit more challenging to be volunteers at places like that. Um, but but in pre-pandemic years, uh, they usually would have volunteers go out and monitor the beaches and make sure that no one comes and, and accidentally steps on the baby turtles that are trying to get out to sea um, and, and make sure that that there's there's no predators flying overhead that come and try to scoop up the little baby turtles as they're trying to get to see it is quite a challenge for them um so only only the the strongest and fastest will survive get into the water and then they can come back later and have uh have their own babies oh i see i see okay well i love that um really quickly just to kind of get into what we're doing so this is the step one um, after you've actually um, printed out your coyote and turdy turtle templates. Um, and then I'm gonna put this one aside and we're actually gonna take a moment and let this dry. I'm gonna go ahead and take the template and we're gonna cut this out. So I know that we were talking about turtles and coyotes. When you're cutting, this is kind of a really cool tip that I don't think a lot of my friends will know when they're younger, is if you cut out your turtle and your coyote sort of in a circle, just like this, this kind of cuts your cutting time. So you would do this for your turtle. So if all my friends can cut out their turtle right now, and then also cut out their coyotes, just like this. And I know I'm cutting a little faster, so don't worry you guys, if it takes you a little bit longer, you can always put this on pause. You can throw this away and take your turtle and cut your turtle out like so just to kind of make sure remember it doesn't have to be perfect when you're cutting your turtle out um, because it's going to be watercolored and you can always create the outline um, however you'd like it i mean it looks pretty much like a really close turtle anyway so if it's if you miss a few things like these little nubs for the feet don't stress um, this is all sort of a good project just to practice learning how to draw silhouettes anyways so yeah, so just kind of know that when you're working on it. Sometimes like so. turtles lose their toes in the wild anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Really? They do, yeah. huh? Can we get a lot I of was... turtles like that? <laughs> um, we've had some red-eared flighters that have come in with missing toes, definitely. But they're totally, you know, they're still kicking it, literally. And, uh, <laughs> I and love they, it it's like healed over and they're totally fine can survive last uh this past february i was actually visited a turtle rest a sea turtle rescue in texas and they had turtles that had entire limbs missing that they were rehabilitating but those turtles were still able to be successful in the wild that is so amazing it's so interesting how we can all sort of heal on a lot of the things that if we get hurt or if we get damaged, how our bodies just repair themselves. It's so incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love and they, they, had, um, they had one turtle that was missing to both of its back legs. So obviously it, that wasn't gonna be able to survive in the wild on its own. So they were keeping it as an educational um, turtle and, and they made a, a fin for it, like a prosthetic, Fin, so that would mm help. -hmm. It would help it uh, be able to. The turtle rehabbers are able to do. That is so neat. I I love that. So that's a good question to kind of answer for some of our kids that are on watching. Is that a lot of times we'll we'll take these animals in, and they can stay safe and they can kind of live to their best potential, just kind of staying with us and being able to live and not be hurt or you know damaged or you know just sort of outside in the wilderness without yeah, you know any protection that's the one of the yeah one of the cool things about a lot of these places um phs doesn't doesn't keep any of our animals as education animals um we just don't have the space for it all of our animals go back out into the wild which i'm really proud of 
That is cool. Okay, so the next part, guys, is we have our awesome color scheme for our sunset, our background sunset. I'm actually gonna pick this one today. So I'm gonna clean my brush, just like so. You guys would dip it in water. Because I have water in this, I just have to just kind of wipe it down and it kind of goes away because I'm kind of a lazy painter sometimes and I like having the water ready. <laughs> so um, this is a really cool technique I want you guys to check out. So this is just basically, we're gonna paint lines straight down our painting. So you're gonna start again, what I said with the lightest. So you're gonna go light to medium to darkest, as you can see. Um, and it'll start blending together organically. So don't fret, it doesn't have to be perfect. So actually, I funny, should say. Can we use any color scheme that we want? So instead of going with reds and oranges, could we yes. go with greens if we wanted? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. I mean, I'm sure any, most of us, have seen all kinds of colors of sunsets. It's always dependent on where the environment is. So sometimes if you see a green sunset, it, you can see some of that because it's reflecting off something else. Um, or if you see a blue sunset, a lot of times it's reflecting off water in the ocean. So definitely, like I said, if you guys don't know the word abstract, it means it doesn't have to look exactly like what you're trying to make it look like. And that's what I love about art is there is no right or wrong in what we're working on. So if you guys want to practice and work on different color schemes for different things, you can still give it the idea of a sunset, but it doesn't mean that it's technically, you know, sort of the perfect sunset. There are no perfect sunsets. It's pretty much what you guys want it to look like. So I guess for this design and this style, I was trying to give the coyote, um, after you have your cutout, kind of a southwest vibe. Um, because this color scheme looks very much like you're in Arizona or in Nevada or somewhere like that. But if you were to change the habitat color, um, it would definitely change the vibe of the painting. So that's just kind of what I opted for this time, but you can go ahead and feel free to pick what you'd like. So I guess in saying that, um, what kind of environment usually do coyotes live in, Lauren? Um, like you said, yeah, there's a lot of different, different environments that coyotes can live in. They are one of the most adaptable animals on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. They are found all over North America and they roam the plains and the forests and the mountains and the deserts of the United States, Canada, Mexico, and even some in Central America. Um, so they are very, uh, very, very adaptable uh to say the least they they also um they will live out like in the more wild areas like the desert um and you know away from people but they also as a lot of you guys probably living situation here in the cities too um out in the out in the desert though since you're drawing the desert um they do like to eat things like cactus fruit um flowers insects rodents lizards rabbits birds and even snakes um will make up some of their diet they are definitely omnivores just like the turtles uh who know that there that there would be something in common for coyotes and turtles huh but uh oh. but yeah they'll they'll eat lots of different things um but in the cities, in our neighborhoods, um, you guys have probably seen it. Uh, they'll eat fruit that's fallen off the trees, uh, roadkill, other small animals um, like rats and bunnies. Um, they'll eat any kind of human food that's left over, any pet food that's left outside. They're very, very opportunistic. Um, if you guys know that word, it means they just will, will basically take whatever they can get their hands on, whatever's the easiest. Um, they're kind of like, I like to describe them as our as our dog's brilliant genius cousin. I don't know if you guys <laughs> saw my dog earlier come out of my tent, <laughs> but as much as I love my dog, he's not as smart as coyotes. They're very, very, very smart. And Lauren, what do you do when you see a coyote in your neighborhood? Like we, see, I've seen some around here. What would What would a kid do if they saw a coyote in their neighborhood? Uh, yeah, so coyotes don't see humans as prey, which is, you know, lucky for us, right? They only get to about 30 pounds. So if you have a pet at home, um, 
maybe you can ask your mom or dad how much your pet weighs and that'll give you kind of a good um good gauge of how big coyotes are in comparison um but yeah maybe 30 35 pounds so they really don't pose uh, an active threat to humans even even kids um the thing is they they might be interested in you because maybe you have food or they're just not as afraid of humans as they naturally should be because um, people have either fed them or they haven't, you know, scared them off the way that, that people should be scaring them off. So um, making loud noises, stopping your feet. Um, hopefully you're with your parent or another um, adult or with some other if you're with other kids, just get into a group, make yourself look like a big, like free headed monster or something. Uh, I like to carry an umbrella with me on walks. If I know that I'm going to be in an area where there's coyotes because I can open and close it really fast and it's really easy. Um, and that usually is scary enough to the coyotes for them to, to want to be like, I don't want to mess with this lady. She seems kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> and it works on people too. <laughs> yeah. Totally. But, uh, but yeah, so, um, so it's just making making sure that you have some sort of noise making device or something with you that can make yourself look big and scary so that the coyotes don't get used to you and other humans being around. Got it. So really quickly before we go to the next part, um, we thanks Lauren for that. Um, we're going to start talking about more about turtles as well. Um, but we are going to go to the next step. So you go ahead and take your turtle that you that you cut out. And I'm actually going to draw two turtles on here um, because I think it just like gives it more of an action vibe. So I'm going to do a half a turtle on the corner. Feel free. And you can color your turtle any, paint your, your turtle any way that you want. Um, but when you do that, just make sure that um, you do, you start with the lightest color first. So I'm going to go ahead and just put my turtle here and do, I'm going to do a, a darker outline than I normally would. Just because you guys are watching, I want to make sure that you guys see the turtle really well. So that's my first turtle. You can see the turtle. Yeah, you can see him. And then I think I'm going to have them going together in the same direction. Um, the last time I had them sort of like this talking, but I think I'm going to have them moving. So this is actually going to give them more movement. And also, if you've noticed, the way that I painted the direction of the brush strokes makes it give it more movement like they're actually floating and maybe swimming actively forward through the water so i'm going to go ahead and do that and then i we can talk about colors really quickly the kind of colors that you guys want to choose i know that um lauren has taught me a lot about the different turtles that are sort of available to uh, for us to paint in their color scheme um, but I think I'm going to stay within the greens, but I'm going to go darker green this time. So in my watercolors, let me move it this way. I'm going to go into these colors. They're kind of dark, but you can see it in that angle. So I'm going to pick these colors here probably because these are the colors that I picked earlier. Um, and I'm going to outline it. I'm going to use my brush that actually has more of a tip on it. Uh, the other one I used was a flat brush. And the cool thing about a flat brush is you can create these really cool specific styles of lines. A thin brush like this that's a little fatter will be really good for doing outlining and filling in quickly, which is something I want to show you guys how to do. So I am going to uh, to separate the design. I'm going to kind of outline the head and the feet um, a different color than the shell. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now as we're talking to Lauren. You guys can kind of see the initial outline. And remember, if I go out of line, it's okay. Don't worry about it, it's watercolor. Remember that the more water that you put in your color, the more it's gonna bleed. So just kind of know that you'll kind of get a better handle as you work with watercolors for a long time. I haven't worked with watercolors very long, but I really like it now. So I'm kind of working on my skills for watercolors. Um, Lauren, what what also, what are they, are they very social creatures, turtles? Yeah, turtles can be definitely, especially the red-eared sliders that we see at the shelter. Um, they they definitely have to be introduced to one another in a controlled environment and watched because they can, you know, get into little tiffs um, if you know one's trying to be a little bit more um, more 
you know, aggressive than the other or trying to exert their dominance. But generally, they are pretty social. You'll see them kind of laying on top of each other um, in, in big groups, which is pretty cute. The sea turtles, um, the sea turtles aren't as social, but um, they still come together, obviously, during like mating season and things like that. Got it. That's so cool. What would someone need in order to uh, adopt a turtle from the shelter? Um, so if you're adopting a smaller one, like I said earlier, you can use the, you can use a tank and keep them indoors. Um, you need a water heater and a filter, um, and an area where they can get up out of the water so that they can be fully out of the water in a basking area. And, um, if you guys know what basking is, it's kind of like when you go out and lay out for a suntan or just a second, kind of soak up the sun that you're, you're basking in the sun. Um, so turtles really like to do that. The red-eared sliders love to do that. You'll see them with their arms complete, arms and legs completely stretched out, um, and it's it's super cute. Um, so so they need a basking area, and um, and they need lots of sunlight um, or a bulb that has uh, has like the sun the sunlight um, equivalent um, bulbs. Air enclosure and in like something like a pond outside, but still with temperature temperature controlled water. Really most important. Um, and and the temperature control water because why, Lauren? Um, because if they get too cold, they can get pneumonia. Oh no. Yeah. Is that it's that really um. Because they're cold blooded, actually. Is that because they're yeah, cold blooded? So exactly, they're reptiles, so um, so they're cold blooded, and uh, and um, and so they are um, they need to be in in an environment that keeps keeps them warm. They do what's called a brumition, which is kind of like hibernation, um, and uh. And so they'll sometimes um, do that during the winter, but mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, they definitely like to be in the warm. Got it. So really quickly, you guys, the next part that I'm doing is the shell. And I think I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pick a darker color to contrast the turtle. Um, the both the different parts of their body. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick this darker green. You can tell with the light shining. Um, and I'm gonna do upward strokes, kind of going one direction, um, because when you do that, it actually will give it more of a 3D, it'll pop up more. Um, and you can always wait and let some of your painting parts dry to come back and do it over and over again. The great part of water, watercolor is you can layer a lot of your paint on top of each other. Um, just the key is to try not to start with dark colors, but go light to dark. So as we keep painting and working, we're just adding different layers. And as you can see, I'm doing these lines, but you can do swirls, you can do squares, you can do, oops, you can do all these cool ways of sort of flipping and turning the, the brush strokes to kind of give it that that different vibe. So definitely, if you just keep working in this direction, like so, it'll give you this really cool design. And I've been taught to see. Yes, Ms. Lonnie, yes, Sarah. We want to let everyone know that we're at about 12:30 right now. Um, so if any of you need to jump off the webinar because you have um, schoolwork or other things you need to get to, don't worry. You're going to be receiving an email tomorrow afternoon with a link to the recording of this webinar. So you can finish watching on your own time and you'll be able to paint along with Miss Lonnie and also um, listen to some amazing wildlife information from Lauren. But for those of you who have time, please stick around. Uh, we'll probably be on for another 10 minutes.
And we'd love to have you continue paint along with Ms. Lonnie and uh, listen to Lauren. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. So as you can see, you guys, I'm pretty much done with this piece uh, as far as sort of the coloring and the painting aspect. Um, what I would recommend is if later on you want to use a pen, you can go ahead and outline and add eyes and add details. I've done this a few times so I can share. I'm really, I'm getting really good, you guys, at these turtles. So check them out. I'm really excited. This one's actually my favorite one. Um, oh, but you know, yeah. it's cool because you can practice and practice and practice. So there we go with that one. The, the last one we're going to work on really quickly is the coyote. So I'm going to hold, I'm going to use this to hold it down. We're going to go ahead and take our coyote template. I'm actually going to put him on the side here because I want to put a little rock formation here on the bottom just to kind of give him more perspective that he's sort of sitting on top of something. So let me go ahead and do the dark line for you guys. So you can kind of see what I'm doing. And as you can see, he's kind of sitting on top in my mind, sitting on top of a rock formation somewhere in the desert. And he's a, he's a him, he's a boy. <laughs> and he is howling. So I'm probably gonna have him howling at the moon. Um, this is a very classic um, sort of image. Um, you'll see a lot of howling in the moon designs throughout your life. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and finish with that, as you can see. And then, you know, I like to freestyle things, which means just kind of do it however I want to do it as I feel. So I'm not going to draw that out. You guys can go ahead. Some of my friends love to draw things out and make sure it's exactly the way that they want it to be. Um, but I'm more freestyling. So I'm going to go ahead and do that in a minute. But I'm just going to do it with my paintbrush. So again, I'm going to use my small tip. And I want to use black because black is really dramatic. And I want it to have a dramatic feel. So the my black is right here. Um, just remember to be really careful when you're working with black because black is black and so it'll get everywhere if you're not careful. But even if it gets somewhere, you can always turn it into something else. So don't worry about that either. There you go. So let me just go ahead. You guys can kind of see how I'm outlining him. And it's really important to have a smaller tip when you're doing this um, just so that you are really, um, you can kind of do the fine details in the cutout because the cutout does have some small, some smaller portions. And as you can Ms. see, Bonnie, if yeah. I don't have, a, if I don't have a very um, fine brush, could I maybe just use a Sharpie to go ahead oh, yeah. and outline? Mm -hmm. You can totally use a Sharpie and then just fill it in, fill it in with a black paintbrush. Um, or you can just fill it in with Sharpie, which is cool because then that makes this a mixed media art project. And I'm a mixed media artist, which means that I basically use all kinds of different uh, mediums, which is different types of art material to make and do things. So I'm not just a watercolor person, but I love using uh, Sharpies, uh, paint, all kinds of things. So if you want to be a mixed media artist, then you would go ahead and use a Sharpie for that. Absolutely. Good point, Sarah. Um, so Lauren, because he's howling, can you tell us a little bit about how coyotes communicate? Yeah, yeah. Coyotes are so, so good at communicating. It's something maybe we can all learn from. Um, they have so many different kinds of vocalizations that if you've ever been in your neighborhood at night and you hear what sounds like 20 coyotes howling, it's usually only like three to five because wow. they can throw their voices. And one coyote can sound like three coyotes. And it's pretty amazing. And they use it to communicate in all kinds of different ways. Um, maybe it's telling other coyotes um, that there's food over here, or maybe it's mating season and they're trying to attract a mate, or maybe they're trying to um, chase out another group of coyotes from their territory. So there's all different kinds of howls for different scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and, and their family structure is set up in such a way that they do really stick together. Um, so usually it's no more than like maybe five or six coyotes in one, um, one pack. And they usually have a territory in our neighborhoods. The territories can be as small as, you know, a mile, uh, square, square mile, but out in like, say where you're painting out in the desert it could be up to like a 10 mile, uh, territory that they kind of just roam and, um, other packs 
kind of leave them alone and they do their own thing, um, which is pretty cool. That is so cool. That is so cool. I like the ears on your coyote too. Coyotes have really big ears and that makes them a little bit different than wolves. Um, a lot of people might be like, oh, that's a cool wolf. And you could be like, no, it's like a coyote. Look at its ears. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they I tend like to my... be most active right during that time too that you're drawing the sunset. Um, they, they like to be out kind of right when dawn is breaking and right at dusk. Um, but obviously when they're living uh, in our neighborhoods, they can be out any time of the day. Anytime that there's food around, they're going to be around, um, especially uh, if they're really used to being around humans. So that's why it's pretty important that anytime we see coyotes in our area, we make sure that we scare them off and remind them to kind of keep their distance from people. So what do they call that when we're trying to scare them off, Lauren? It's called hazing. Um, and we do that with a, with pretty much any kind of wildlife um, that we want to like retrain their behavior. Um, basically, it's just uh, negative reinforcement and, and reminding them that, you know, if they come around, they're going to be uh, they're going to be yelled at and, uh, it's not going to be, it's not going to be very comfortable for them. So they're not going to leave our, our neighborhoods, but they, they'll at least, um, be reminded that, you know, people aren't something to, to be comfortable around. And that's the main goal. And that's because we care about them, right, Lauren? And we want to make sure that they stay safe and they stay away from us. That's exactly right. Yeah. If they get too comfortable with people, then that's when that's when things like accidental bites happen. Um, and so we keep the coyotes safe and humans safe by by doing hazing. Um, so that way we can we can uh, we can all coexist peacefully together. I love that. So remember, you guys, I'm almost done. The most important thing that Miss Lonnie always forgets and people have to remind her is she has to sign her work. So always remember to sign your work because sometimes you get so excited about your work, you forget that you want people to know that you that it was your work. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Miss Lonnie here at the end on both pieces because it's important for people to see that you're super talented and that you did this and that you'll forever remember that you worked on this. So these are my two pieces, you guys. I added a little circle sort of in the background Remember the, the moon, the sun, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just supposed to be an expression of you and what you're doing. So check them out, you guys. I would love to see you guys share your work with us as well. And thank you so much for everything, Warren. I really enjoyed you giving me all this information and kind of giving yeah. this information to our, to our kids. Thanks for having me. I would love to see everyone's pictures. I hope everybody posts some and tags Pasadena Humane Society on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, same. Thank you, Miss Lonnie, and thank you, Lauren. And as they said, please uh, share and then tag us at Pasadena Humane in any of your posts. And you can also email any of your work, any um, pictures or scans you have of your work to kids at PasadenaHumane.org. All right, that's it for us for today. We hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, Miss Lonnie. Thank you, Lauren. Bye, Bye you guys. Thank you.